The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Something that uh, come to my attention, and when I repeat something, it's not like I'm having a senior moment. I repeat it for the purposes that when there is a quickening, um, you know, like uh, when you're reading the scriptures and something is quickened to you, that's God speaking to you through His Word. All right, you should pay more attention to that than just overall reading. Right? That's like kind of like a spiritual function to learn to to catch what God is speaking. But I've come to the conclusion that one of the most important things is knowing what do we do in light of the times we're in. And I've shared it before. I said as much as that we are a prophetic people and we love to hear prophetic words, uh, it's for me, our entire ministry from the day I got saved was what do we do in light of the prophetic words? I can still remember when we were doing that book signing. I shared that last week. We were doing a book signing, and, and uh, they were quoting uh, <coughs> Bob Jones's uh, prophetic word of billion soul harvest. And they said, so we've got to get ready for that billion soul harvest, and we need to. It was like he had a momentary epiphany. And we were doing a book signing that day, and they said, maybe you ought to get Dennis and Jennifer's book <laughs> as far as what to do in light of. See, a prophetic word can tell you what's going to happen, but what makes, how do you make ready a people prepared? Where's the redemptive solution? Where, what, what should we be doing in light of those words instead of just, okay, thank you. When it happens, I'll see it. You know, uh, all through Scripture, there was always patterns and principles. And God builds according to a pattern based on principle. You can see that in Proverbs. You can see that in the Beatitudes in the New Testament. Patterns based on principles. And God builds that way. And uh, <clears throat> I believe that uh, the anointing that's necessary for such a time as this is like an Issachar anointing. How many even know what an Issachar anointing is? Issachar was one particular tribe, various giftings in the tribes of Israel. But Issachar had knowledge of what Israel ought to do in light of the times. You know, there's different responses based on what God is doing. And to, in order to cooperate with it, we need wisdom and insight. So, well, what do we do in light of that? So uh, when I ask the Lord about what to do, He constantly tells me the same thing, to make ready a people prepared. Watch what I'm going to do. And right now, there's so much sidetrack in our culture, so much diversion, intentional and otherwise, to distract you from the things that are going on. But in reality, it's like a tale of two kingdoms. Uh, at every moment throughout history, God is doing something, the enemy is doing something, but it's always easier. You don't even need to be spiritual to see what the enemy is doing, right? It'll be in your face. It'll be overt. It'll be even like when, when, when the enemy speaks a negative word to you, it's intrusive. It's, it's right there. It's not, it's not always subtle. However, the subtleties of the enemy is to do what? to try to get you to believe it's good. And uh, John Bevere has a wonderful book, Good or God. There's a difference. And the enemy doesn't always uh, shove it right in your face. Somehow he'll have to build a scenario to where this is for your good. <laughs> Boy, if we don't see that in our culture now. Oh, this is for your good. Uh, but... Uh, what, what he's been speaking to me is that uh, we're going to see a powerful move of God and it's going to make a lot of things that we explain now unnecessary. Do you realize that? Like the early church, like we're walking with a candlelight worth of revelation. The early church was, bam, impacted on the day of Pentecost with a thousand watt light bulb. There was a whole lot of things that didn't need explained because it was like, uh I know. I've experienced it. 
but we're in a stage to where from the inception of my ministry anyway, and Jennifer corroborates this, is what God says is that because we don't have that, the most loving thing you can do to make ready a people prepared is give them how-tos. The how-tos is basically how to do, and this is worth writing down because we used to get emails from pastors, leaders, mature saints, people that have been in the church for 20, 30, 40 years, and the, there was a commonality to their emails, and here it is. In essence, here's somebody telling us how to do what we already knew we were supposed to do. What's that saying? It's saying, we as a biblically literate people, we know what the Bible says, we know what it says we should do. Here's somebody telling us how to do what we already know we're supposed to do. And you wouldn't believe how many people we've seen over the decades uh, that got set free with some little aspect of something that they've always wanted to do scripturally, but they go, I don't know how to do that. You know, and then suddenly when all of a sudden there's the ability to tap into the, to the Jesus in them and to accommodate and cooperate with that principle, it's life-changing. And that's what we want. We want the, the things that you know the Bible says. We're not going to teach you new scripture. We're teaching you what the Bible says and then how do I actually live that? Amen. I don't want to just know it in my head. I want to live it. And one of the, the areas is let's, let's look at this. Let's imagine, imagine that you've never read the Bible and you had a suddenly, and you're, we're going to call you a bunch of Gentiles, all right? You have no Old Testament. You have no Ten Commandments. And you were impacted by the power of God. And you believe I, this Jesus, the Messiah, is real. You might not even know the word Messiah because you weren't Jewish. Let's picture, you're a Gentile. You had ten gods and a culture that had everything goes. And now all of a sudden you got impacted by the power of the Spirit and you go, there's a reality here. Because even now, you know, the older I get, the part that's a little bit kind of uh, building a, a tolerance in me more and more is I'm seeing young upstarts who are clearly gifted clearly prophetic, but quite frankly, they're going to have to change some of the things they say as they grow and learn things, right? Isn't that the danger of a Hollywood person getting saved, and then they open their mouth and they say, oh, and you say, oh, well, somebody please disciple them before, because they've got such a huge following. Well, that's true. That's true in our generation, too. You could be a gifted singer, piano player, keyboard player, guitar player, and all of a sudden rise instantly to fame and basically say all kinds of stupid stuff that you believe is God. So we're going to have to learn to say, you know what, they're young, they're growing, and this too shall pass. <laughs> and it's part of the way, I know uh, Sid, Sid said the same thing I did. We were like two loose cannons when we first got saved. I wouldn't want to hear some of the things that I said early on. <laughs> I mean, I was on a television program and I wasn't more than maybe, maybe tops a year old in the Lord. And I didn't think that uh, this was in a Pittsburgh station, uh, Russ Bixler. Um, uh, they still have that cornerstone television, I believe, in, in, in the Pittsburgh area. But anyway, I was invited to give my testimony on there, and I gave my testimony. And I didn't think I didn't think he was flowing properly, so I kind of said what I wanted to say and didn't quite answer his questions. <laughs> then I got reprimanded after that. He said, "Don't ever do that." And I cried all the way home. I quit. It's Christianity's too hard. So you're like, whoa, way up there. Exalted millions of people are listening to. You did it wrong, dummy. <laughs> yeah. Huh? You know, it's like kind of like a manic depressive. You have high highs and low lows. And really everybody's a little bit manic depressive, just a question of degree. <laughs> Think about that one. All right. So, all right. To make ready a people prepared, let's assume you're all Gentiles, because I want to get you to ready for when the power of God really comes. Uh, it was like that one, one gentleman said, he says, people are calling for the glory, calling for the glory. He says, you know, some of you would be dead if the glory really came in its fullness. 
You know, Ananias and Sapphira, that's a hard story, but that's not in there for no reason. It's to show you the, 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 the power of love, but also the judgment of God. And theirs was to lie to the Holy Spirit. And I'm sitting there thinking, we've got to deal with just plain old gossip in the church. Huh? They don't even call that sin anymore. So it's like, how do you make ready a people prepare? Well, let me, let me, we're going to, we're going to do this together, all right? This is for this church here, which should know better. And for those of you watching, I want you to imagine that you're a first century church and you know nothing. You didn't read the Bible because there wasn't one, right? <laughs> there was an Old Testament, but there was no Bible. And all of a sudden you have an impact with Jesus. And you know that you know that you know you had an experience. You didn't have to explain it. You knew that you knew, even if you didn't know what knowing that you know means. There was a reality to it, okay? Then you go get mentored by an experienced mentor. And you say, I'm, I want to live this life. This is the way we were meant to live. This is real. There really is a God, and I have been imp I've been impacted by Him. I've had an experience in God. And so you go to your first class, and the Didache is, is 16 little page, little chapters. Some of them have a few verses. It's a skinny little thing like this. But they mentored them using that outline of the Didache for a year to three years. <laughs> so that tells me that those 16 little pages need to be amplified a little bit in experiential living. But I want to challenge the church at large around the world to how about chapter one in the Didache and only the three verses and let's have a test, let the Spirit test us and see how well are you doing with this. Hmm? Three verses, chapter one. That means if you were in that day, had an experience with Jesus, and you came to be mentored, this is what you would be taught and expected that you would cooperate with the grace of God, the empowerment of God, and live it. All right? Lesson number one, verse one. There's two ways to live one is of death. One is of life, and great is the chasm between the two. Well, what are you going to choose? Well, I'm going to choose life. I'm not going to choose the way of death. There's a great chasm, so this should not be complicated. When there's a great chasm, the way of life and the way of death is being separated out very distinct. It seems like any idiot could figure it out, right? <laughs> There's a great chasm between the two. The way of life is, here's the way of life. So now I'm going to tell you how to do the way of life. We already got you to choose. and that, that was, It wasn't hard. That wasn't a hard choice, was it? If that was a, on your test paper, there's two ways to live, the ways of life and the ways of death. Choose. I don't think there was a whole lot that got that one wrong. Uh, I think I'll take the way of death. I don't know. I'm not a very happy person. The way of life is first this. You ready to walk that way of life? No, you chose it, right? You're going, I'm just, I just don't know anything, but I'm in this class, and uh, I, I know that Jesus is real, and uh, wow, that I have a, oh, poo, he came into my life, and shoo, God is real. And this is, first, you will love the Lord your God that made you. Okay, how do I do that? Well, you feel, you feel his presence? Well, his presence, his love in you, is what you love him back with. Now, we know scripturally we love because he first loved us. You can't love him with your human love. He doesn't care about your human love. You can't give him anything that's redemptive unless it came from him in the first place. Oh, we've got to love the Lord my God. How do I do that? I could, maybe we'll spend a month on that, on how you learn to love him with his love instead of your sentiment, your good feelings, and all of your preconceived notions. 
That, that could go for a couple months right there. How do I love the Lord my God that made me? And isn't it interesting, they're Gentiles, so they didn't say, love the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, because that only applied to the Jews. God didn't bring you out of the land of Egypt. He brought you out of a land of Egypt type. But in reality, He made you. You know what that did? It was a beautiful way to take these new believers who received Jesus, loved Jesus, but they were raised with ten gods. And all of a sudden, it's, i got to love the Lord that made me. This is the God that made me. And we're going to have to deal with it, any concepts of other gods, aren't we? I'm sure they use the Old Testament scripture. I am, I am the Lord, your Savior, and there's none other. Whoa, none other. That just eliminated my history and my upbringing of ten gods. There was a God of this and a God of that and a God of this and a God of that, and all of a sudden now there's only one. Then it says, secondly, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And whatever you do not want to do, be done to you, do not do that to someone else. Now here's the part. Now, the teaching of these words is this. Say good things about those who say bad things about you. That probably, there's probably a couple of little tilt, tilt. Say that again. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I want you to say good things about people who say bad things about you. I could see that class. I could see them looking at each other going, all right, and how do we do that? Say good things. You're going to have to love people that are saying bad things about you and let that love flow and you say good things about them. This is class one. This is the first half hour. This is the first verse. Are you passing so far? Do you say good things about people that have spoken against you? Now listen to this. Pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. That means people that you know have issues with you, you pray for them. And that presupposes that you love them. So that means you've already forgiven them. You're already walking in a forgiveness lifestyle. You have no walls between you and them. And you're praying for them. And if you're praying, it has to be love motivated or it's not praying. <laughs> And this one, and I've had uh, pastors comment on this one, fast for those who persecute you. <laughs> you, know, you know what other pastors say? Wow, I don't think most of my people would even pray for, fast for their friends. Think about it. Have you fasted for a friend? How about fasting for an enemy? This is class one, first two verses. You, to me, you sink or swim, right? I think some people go, I'm, I'm done, I am, I'm taking this class. No, mm -mm. Except the power of God was so real, I believe that they could actually be weeping while they're hearing that. Being touched and tenderized by the spirit of the living God on the inside of them. This is not an intellectual function. This is why we need the how-tos now, because we're not operating in that kind of an outpouring. We're in a time of God restoring truth. You know, there was a, an origination on the day of Pentecost, and that's what these people experienced. Then there was a gradual historical deterioration, and then there is a gradual restoration. So we're moving forward and upward, but we don't have what they had. And when people get baptized in the Holy Spirit and they speak in tongues, you, do, you did not really get what they got on the day of Pentecost. I'm sorry. You got something similar, 
But these people turned the world upside down. Now the teaching of these words is this, bless them that curse you, say good things to those that are saying bad things to you, pray for your enemies, fast for those who persecute you. Now this sounds like scripture that we know. It says, for what credit is to you if you love those that love you? Don't even the heathen do the same? But for your part, love those who hate you and you will have no enemies. When a man's ways please the Lord, we know that's Old Testament. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. All right? But what they showed here is that this was a love commandment right from the beginning, that if you loved your enemies, there would be a heart change. Because what do you do with enemies normally? You get hurt. Oh, they hate me. Well, instead of being wounded, you release loving intercession to someone that hates you, and from the heart you get perception. Remember, you have to have the heart of Jesus to have the eyes of Jesus. You get your heart right about these people that are attacking you, and all of a sudden your eyes, the heart changes to love. Actually, you know, when you forgive somebody, if you paid attention, after you remove the barrier on the other side of that forgiveness is love. That's loving intercession. There's a nice flow. There's no wall. There's no hurt. There's no anger. There's no hostility. There's nothing in the way now. So what's flowing is actually love is flowing. But love is flowing out. Your perception now sees, oh, that person that's my enemy or has made themselves an enemy to me is actually the victim. Oh it can actually stir up even more compassion. They need Jesus. And if they've already got Jesus, they need Jesus to deal with their issues, don't they? But it's not going to be my issue because I'm releasing forgiveness to them. Love those that hate you, and you will have no enemies. Okay, how many are going to stay in that class? And keep in mind that the people in that class, these Gentiles, these heathen with no training whatsoever except a radical experience in Jesus, basically in many cases were already thrown out of their families, destitute, didn't know where their next meal was coming from because they were an embarrassment to the status quo of their culture. And yet they considered everything like Paul, loss and rubbish compared to the excellency of what I found in him. Now, in light of what do we do in light of the season that we're in, I believe one of the weaknesses I see, of course, don't look for theology on Facebook, please. Go talk to your pastor or talk to somebody knowledgeable. I, I could spend all day commenting on bad theology on Facebook, and most of them mean well. Some of them say God said when it was really their aggravation doing the talking. <laughs> if you're aggravated, don't say God said. Say you're aggravated, and I have a problem, and I need ministry. <laughs> that would be a truer statement. But you know, sometimes people are young and they need to grow and mature and develop as time goes. So, how do we learn to practice the presence of God? We're not operating with a thousand watt light bulb, we're operating with a flashlight. And God is restoring truth uh, to the church. And there will be clearly an awakening, just as there have been historically awakenings. And in awakening, suddenly the light turns on and a whole lot of things don't need explained. But what do you do in preparation for such a time as this? What has historically taken place through the church that God, you know, God builds according to a pattern based on a principle? Never has there been an outpouring of God that wasn't preceded by repentance. Never. So to me, that would say, if you're going to make ready a people prepared, repentance is going to have to come up to the forefront. And there's already plenty of teaching out there of, of false grace that you don't have to forgive. 
again. You did it once. You don't have to ever repent again. You did it once. And unfortunately, that's not even good scripturally, and yet it's very prevalent because you fashion it according to what's convenient for you. But do you realize that when God says to the seven churches in Revelations, they were Christians? They were already Christians to the church, to the ecclesia, to the called out and assembled ones, repent. So I don't even know how they can justify that false grace teaching, but it's prevalent and it's popular. Why would it be popular? Because then it would make sense if it's easy. Oh, yeah. Well, sin is easy. <laughs> you know. So to make ready and people prepared, I wanted to just cover a real quick outline of when we traveled, things that we saw seasoned Christians did not quite understand or they just never thought of it. But if it's going to help you be ready for what's coming, then I'm going to say this. I want everyone to know how to touch God in the spirit. Touch, touching God, practicing his presence. And we use the message translation. And anyone that's taken any of our material should know this inside out and backwards. But you have no idea how many hundreds of thousands of Christians don't even know the basics of what we're going to cover today. Not even the basics. Location, location, location. They don't know how it operates. They don't know where it is. And they're just kind of shooting from the hip. Okay? But first, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. We know that scripture in uh, standard translations. We know them as uh, the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and arguments and every high, proud, lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. All right, so we have to learn how to take those down. But listen to this in the message. We use our powerful God tools for fitting. Is God about building? And he wants to build with people, living stones, a habitation of God. And by the way, when we covered uh, gossip, Gossip destroys what God or works against what God is trying to build. God is trying to build with his word people together. What gossip does is try to unassemble what God is trying to put together. It's working against his building process. Now, the God tools are for fitting every loose thought, Look where I'm pointing. Every loose thought. You know, did you ever get weird thoughts up here? Only me? Did you ever lay awake at night with weirdness going through your head? God says, I want to take those loose thoughts, I want to lasso them, pull them back, and bring them captive. Because that's not me, says the Lord. <laughs> you bring those thoughts captive. Lasso some of them to play them over and over in your head, you have the capacity to not do that by saying, that's not me. Oh, wait a minute. It's in my head. Who is it? It's got to be me. It's got to be me. <laughs> <Right? laughs> Break into song here. This is so good. The real you is a new creation joined together with the Lord, one spirit with him. When you start believing unscriptural things in your head, that you is separate from God. You've come out from among that union and communion, and you're acting independently. You're separating yourself from God. To act independently from God is sin, no matter how good it looks. We fit every loose thought. Oh, listen to this. We're fitting every loose thought and emotion. <laughs> and impulse. So there's mind, will, and emotions. Thoughts, will, emotions. I'm trying to fit every loose thought, every emotion, and every choice or impulse into a life shaped by Jesus. So that means he wants all three then, doesn't it? He wants all three. He wants your mind. He wants your will. He wants your emotions. And he wants to, he doesn't want to destroy them 
He wants them to be submissive to him so that he can use your mind, your will, and your emotions. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His will is his pleasure. His emotions are the fruit of the Spirit. That's why you have emotions. For the fruit of the Spirit to flow through them. So he wants to bring these captive in a structure of a life that's shaped by Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. Touching God is a way of life. It's not supposed to be just a one-time event. I'm saved, and then I just live whatever way I want to. It was meant to be a moment-by-moment -moment experience. And the secret is basically moving from that supernatural encounter. And how did you know if you had a supernatural encounter? Peace. Okay, there's only two answers. If I ever ask you a question, it's either peace or forgiveness. All right. Once you've had that supernatural encounter, you had peace with God. You had, you made your peace with God. You have the peace of God. And then the rule of a Christian walking in the Spirit is the God of peace. Peace with God, the peace of God, and the God of peace. Let the peace of God rule. When He's ruling, the God of peace is ruling. Forgiveness and peace should be the internal criteria that even a baby Christian or a mature Christian would be able to, to differentiate between whether they're walking in the Spirit or walking in the flesh. You cannot be trusting God and stressed at the same time. You cannot. You're doing one or the other. You're either trusting in yourself when you're stressed because peace is always available. Peace didn't go anywhere. You went from the peace by mind, will, or emotion. What's interesting is God wants your will. The devil wants your will. To get your will meaning to do what? Right or wrong. There's two doors. And the enemy is working from the outside, which is really at a disadvantage unless you don't practice the presence of God. It's a disadvantage because the only way he can get your will, he can't go directly to your will. He has to go to your thoughts and go, hey, you're dumb, you're crazy, you're, you're dirty, you're no good, and be intrusive. If that works, he got your will and you will act accordingly. There's another door, the emotion door. If he can't get you with the thinking, you go, no, that's not me, that's not scriptural, God don't talk like that. You've got to get to the point where you know that God doesn't talk like that. You've got a poor image of God if you think he's mean and judgmental towards you. The only one that condemns is the enemy. That's his job, he wants to condemn. Correction always has love attached to it, always. No exception. If you're hearing something corrective and it doesn't have the love of God behind it, it doesn't make you want to melt into God's arms and please Him. It's probably too intrusive. So He can't get you with the thought you're too biblically literate. Oh, what do I do? I have another door, the emotion door. And what's He doing with that one? And that one's quite effective. He goes, Ugh. And then watches the Christians. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Oh, man, I better call somebody for help. Oh, 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 meltdown. Gee, who started that meltdown? Not you, because you would be the new creation you who doesn't choose meltdowns. Who gets meltdowns? The enemy. And he loves it. And one time we were teaching the little kids, they wanted to understand it's a big, big God. They used to sing a little song in, our, in my first church's uh, Sunday school. It's a big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil. And the kids would have pictures of a little rat with a loudspeaker, you know, a big megaphone going, Arr! and that's really all it is. Kind of like the, what was that, the Wizard of Oz, the guy behind the curtain. So just because it, 
feels big doesn't mean it's powerful. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. But the enemy's got two doors. The mind door, and I've actually watched the person get, you know, on many occasions, um, back in the day, when all of a sudden they would receive forgiveness and they would repent over something and they'd get free and demonic activity, you didn't even have to cast it out, demonic activity would lift off and they'd go, oh, I feel, hear the word? I feel it lifting and it, and it goes instantly to the head and overplays its hand almost without exception. It goes, this isn't working, I'm coming back. Now normally, he can fool the average Christian by speaking in first person. I find that an exciting time of him overplaying the hand. You don't talk like that to yourself, do you? I'm not leaving. Because he's trickier. He can get you to believe it's you. But when he's on his way out, he says stuff like that only because you should be rejoicing and say, that's a sign of... Uh, He's going, he's, I'm not going. Of course, he's a liar, so he's going to say, I'm not going, while he's going. <laughs> and how do you know? You will actually feel the presence lift. But by using the word, I feel, guess what he does? He goes to the thoughts. It's obvious I'm getting a victory over the fear. So now he's got to say, I'm not going, or I'm coming back as soon as Dennis is gone. But if you get the victory here, he's going to go, oh, you don't want, eh, this is terrible. You should just stay home. You should go in a closet and sit in a corner. Yeah. You'll be safe there. Isn't that interesting how demons will tell you to isolate yourself to be safe? Uh, you can even say, I need to be alone and pray. Sometimes that's true and sometimes that's not God. Why? Because if he can isolate you, he can, he can get all kinds of weirdness that you're not bouncing off of anybody. Isn't that true? I worry about sometimes people going on retreats. If you don't have someone on the retreat that you can bounce stuff off of that's a mature Christian, you might come back with some wacky ideas. So the next time you go to your prayer closet, I'm getting alone to pray. You know, sometimes that's, I'm on a... Here, here's the translation of that, getting alone to pray in some cases. I want to get away from everybody that aggravates me. <laughs> oh, let's just be honest, right? I've been in this too many years. <laughs> I've seen all of these things. Now, there's times there is legitimate. You do need to get alone and pray. There's no doubt about that. But there's just isolation was not what you were made for. Society in general, did you know there's always anywhere in the world communities? Because you were made to need one another. So always be aware that whenever you don't need anybody and you don't want to be around anybody, that the problem could be you. Hmm? First, one of the first demons that God revealed to me as a baby Christian, I think I was about a year old, uh, just experienced the, the death of a relative and watched them as they slowly died of cancer and fought for every breath. And in the midst of that horrific event, I felt like, do you ever see, notice how standing under a street light, especially in the city, has that blue haze to it? And I could feel a lonely, like, I'm the only Christian in my family. I'm all alone. And the Lord spoke and said, that's a demon. And it shook me up, and I recognized that. And I said, I am not alone. He never leaves me. And that thing lifted. And all of a sudden, that hazy street light where I was standing out in front of the hospital, that hazy blue light was filled with a sense of awareness of God's presence and His power. Lonely is not just an emotion. Lonely, most of the time, is a demonic activity trying to isolate you. So if you ever struggle with, I am lonely, know that there's an enemy that's trying to separate you 
It's an old strategy. The children of Israel, the stragglers were the ones where Amalek, who was a type of Satan, came out of the hills and who did he attack? The stragglers, the ones who were isolated from the rest of the children of Israel. It's an old strategy. It's nothing new. But God's basically saying we need these powerful God tools. We need to learn that forgiveness is a supernatural encounter, but then a walking out of that encounter. As you received him, so walk in him. So I really want to challenge our people to basically know beyond a shadow of a doubt location because I see on Facebook there's quite a few people. Some of them are quite popular, have huge followings, and they don't know what they're talking about. But that's because they're kind of new. You know, they, they, they'll change. There's some that have changed recently that were like celebrity Christians and then gradually said a bunch of dumb stuff and other people caught them on it and apparently somebody with love is discipling them. But I'm going to close with this. Location, location, location. This is something when we traveled, we were shocked that even mature Christians did not know their physiology or their spiritual anatomy. All right? Let's start with spirit, soul, and body. Those are three major distinctive parts to your makeup. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, I believe, fills you from head to toe in that invisible realm. You have a human spirit. When you get, you had a human spirit before you got saved. What happened was Jesus came in and his spirit joined with your spirit and you became a new creation. Conscience. If something bothers your conscience, point to your conscience. I want to see even in this crowd. Where's your conscience? Very good. But uh, there's a whole lot of people out there that did this. You didn't do it in this room which is very re relieving to me. Your conscience is here. If you did something wrong and it go, <clears throat> the conscience, even though your spirit fills you head to toe, your conscience is the voice of your spirit. Right from wrong, truth from error, and when you obey your conscience, it should change to peace. If it changes to peace when you obey, that means you're walking in the light that you have. Now, conscience is not perfect because you may not be biblically literate. <laughs> but nonetheless, even if you're not biblically literate and you're a newborn Christian like, like these Gentiles, at least if you walked in the light that you'd have, you would have peace with God. It doesn't mean you don't need to learn more. So where's your conscience? All right, here's another tough one. Where are your emotions? Here's an easy one. Everybody should pass this. Where are your thoughts? Now here's the one where we would lose 99% along with conscience. They point to the temple. We'd say, where's your will? And in huge churches, they point here to your will. So if you are going to get born again and ask Jesus to come into your heart, do you know how many people think he comes into the blood pumper? Loads. Thanks to Hallmark cards, they all think he's in the blood pumper. But now we've got people going, God is not in your stomach. <laughs> well, I didn't eat him. <laughs> but it only shows that you really don't have a strong awareness of his presence because the gut is the epicenter. And if you did even minimal research, Old Testament and New Testament, it's bowels, belly, gut, even some translation, even whom. It's the innermost being. And there are plenty of scriptures that say, out of your belly. I know the modern translations say, out of your heart. 
but then you got people thinking it's coming out of here. All right. This is the seat of the emotions. This is the doorway. When you ask Jesus to come in your heart, he didn't stand up here and go, can I come in your head? You don't even talk like that. But if you don't know that he came into your heart and you have peace with God and peace is experienced, uh, here's the other one. You can't live by those feelings. Memorize this. This is complicated. There are three sets of feelings. Physical feelings. You stub your toe. Ow! That's called physical pain. All right? Then you got your feelings hurt. You didn't stub your toe. Somebody ignored me. It hurt. That's called emotional pain. But then these Christians who got born again. Whoa, whoa, I feel, whoa, I feel joy. I feel peace. I feel love. Whoa, I feel His presence. That's spiritual feelings. So when you hear someone say you can't live by your feelings, I think they haven't cultivated spiritual feelings sufficiently or made a proper distinction between physical pain and feeling, emotional feeling, and spiritual feeling. But whose fault is that? Huh? That's not my fault that you haven't been trained or learned the difference. It might mean that you're not very intimate with God. If you can't tell the distinction, then perhaps you need to get alone <laughs> in your prayer closet and meet Him spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. Commune. And plenty of scriptures, New Testament, Old Testament says that you will seek him and find him. And if you look up those words in the Greek, in the New Testament, and the Hebrew, that seeking, that looking, is groping after him as to touch him. In other words, you want to touch reality, not theory, reality. All the head people, all through every major awakening, the head people argued with the spirit people. Every awakening, intellectuals almost squelched many moves of God because they insisted that it be totally understandable up here. Good luck. Because there's experiences in God that you're going to have to know in your knower before this knower knows. <laughs> You can insist to know it up here all you want, but that's backwards. It says, if you will, if you're willing to do, John 7, 17, if you're willing to do my will, you shall know. Oh, man, that means I've got to humble myself before God and be willing to do it his way before I'm going to know it. No, I want to know in advance and then maybe I'll do it. Well, good luck. I've never seen that work. I don't think you call God on the carpet and tell Him how to do it. I think He's going to want you to humble yourself and seek Him. When we talk about God tools, we're talking, sure, the blood of Jesus, understanding where the door of the heart is. Yes, your spirit fills your head to toe, but this is the epicenter. This is the place of activity. This is the door, and your will is the door of the heart. And we even have to do activities. First of all, we have to do spiritual feeling as opposed to just carnal feeling. And we would stand someone up who was answering the altar 30 times to get saved again and again. And we've been to churches where that's common practice. They sin once, and then they got to go get saved again. So we would have them put their hand right here, the epicenter, the seat of the emotions, the door of the heart, the will, and then whisper a scripture in their ear so that their head, and then say, how does that feel? And yes, we use the word feel. How did that feel? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed. Do this to yourself. Do this to yourself. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me, that I should be called a child of God. If that feels good spiritually, that is your assurance. Assurance is not in the head. Assurance is in the heart. 
It's a title deed. It's a no-so. Oh, what do you mean? No-so. Isn't that up here? No. This is a knower. And this knower learns by seeing, hearing, and touching and informs this knower. Any true revelation of Jesus, any true revelation from the Word goes from down up, not up down. And for years I've heard people say, including preachers, we got to get that down into our spirit. You know what? Why not go to Jesus in your spirit and let it go up to your head? Be the easy way. And even saying it, you can say some scriptures over and over again and you know eventually you might yield your will and it takes. But you know even that's the hard way and that's very commonplace. Oh, perfect love cast out fear. Oh, perfect love cast out fear. You still got fear. No matter how many times you say it, but eventually you go, oh, perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love does cast out. You, you could do it easier by just going to your spirit instead of much repetition. Even if you think much repetition worked, because eventually you yielded with much repetition. You got tired enough to do it right <laughs> by accident. I wonder how many people did things right by accident. They tried so hard, oh, that daughter of mine, that daughter of mine, oh, that daughter of mine, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, Jesus, change her, change her, oh, God, oh, get her, get her to stop smoking them cigarettes, oh, God, get her, quit taking those drugs, oh, God, oh, God, I just really, oh, I'm tired, well, I just let it go. And all of a sudden, the daughter says, I've got delivered, I accepted Jesus. <laughs> Do you think there's a correlation between letting go and letting God be God? And you not being God and micromanaging helicopter moms. Somebody said, what's a helicopter? That's someone that hovers. <laughs> Hovering is not anointing. Hovering is controlling. Controlling is not under control. Under control is the lordship of Jesus. When you're under his control, you're under lordship. Let the peace of God rule. Let Jesus rule. And you know what's funny? If you've been controlled most of your life by parents, strong-armed parents, you probably are a controller until you deal with it. Because you, you who judge, you do the same thing. It's a law. You want to break that law. That's the law of sowing and reaping. You want to reap something good? I release the demands and expectations. I release forgiveness to all those controllers in my life because I'm going to let Jesus be my Lord of my life. And you know what? When Jesus is Lord, when he's really Lord, when peace rules, nobody can control you. <laughs> I don't know. For me, that's liberating. Nobody can control Someone who's under control. Locate the heart. Now we can see it's in the belly location. It's our entire emotional and spiritual heart life. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the innermost parts of the belly. Well, if he's not there, where is he? Scripture says he's there. So all these people say, God's not in the stomach. Or, it's absurd. He's not in the stomach like you ate him. But this is where your conscience is. I didn't eat my conscience. But your conscience is here. I think we need kindergarten physiology and anatomy training for the average Christian to really begin to prosper properly. I want to walk in the Spirit, and I want you to walk in the Spirit. But you can't just do it because you want to. You're going to have to learn, just like a baby. They, they learn to flip over before they crawl. They crawl before they walk. They walk before they run. Well, some do. <laughs> some seem like the minute they're done crawling, they're running. But nonetheless, there's a process. And that process is true for us. And Jennifer and I have a mandate right now to make ready a people prepared. And that new book that comes out, could you see that you're going to need some how-tos? Who could, who could really, in the flesh, you can't do the first three verses in chapter one. 
how did they take these Gentiles who were clueless and get them to do that? I would think there would be a great, there'd be a great absence of people in that class almost instantly. But not if they were impacted by the Spirit. But until you're impacted by the Spirit, what do I do? I need the grace of God, which is available, and grace is empowerment. I need the empowerment to want to, with all my heart, to yield my will and say, I will cooperate with that. Guide me into all truth, Holy Spirit. Help me to be willing to be willing. There's a good start right there. I want to be willing to be willing. I want to be ready so that when the power of God comes, I know that I've done this. And, and I, I think it's fair to say, you usually don't talk about your fasting, but I fast and pray for people I don't even know that don't like me. And you know, this last time we were on with Sid, that was 100,000 views. Do you think there isn't a portion of those people like, that guy's a devil or something? You know, come on, there's trolls everywhere. Let's face it, and they're on Facebook. There's one guy I pray for, guy, girl, whoever, that I pray for regularly. He's been missing the last couple of weeks, but <laughs> we get one thumbs down on every message that goes on YouTube. You know that's the same person, and you know they're not listening. Right? If it's the same, I would, if I gave a thumbs down every single time I heard me, I wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> but you know what that's a sign of? That's a sign of somebody that really is the victim of their own heart. And so what the Lord did based on the Diddy case, so you pray for them regularly. So I don't know who they are, but they get a lot of prayer from me. Bless them to speak evil. And I know they don't listen. They just do the, do the thumbs down. Now I'll probably get 20 thumbs down. I want prayer too. I want to give my thumbs down. Maybe you'll pray for me. <laughs> Bless them that speak evil of you. Pray for them who are your enemies. Hmm? Now we know, Roma, do good to them that hate you. But how about fast for your enemies? Anybody got somebody getting on your case? Don't raise your hand. Might be family. Anybody getting on your case? Fast for them. Pray for them. Bless them. And next week, get our new book and and. Start from page one, and I hope you get past that. It's pretty easy, right? Bless them that say good things about those who curse you. Pray for your enemies. Fast for those who persecute you. Everybody's going, yes, I want to do that. As soon as I leave, I'm going to fast and pray for everybody that hates me. Just like that one pastor said, I don't think they even pray for their friends, <laughs> yet alone their enemies. Think about it. Think about it. That was lesson one for the early church. Lesson one. We should be aspiring to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God and say, God, that sounds too hard. And he goes, yes, it is. And in the flesh, you can't do none of that. But don't you, aren't you willing to be willing? Let's pray that. Father, I am willing to be willing to be led by the grace of God, the empowerment of God, to walk in a deeper and a greater communion with you. I want to walk in the light that I have, but perhaps, God, what I'm asking for right now is more light. And with more light, it doesn't mean you're getting worse. You know, I've seen people do that. They're growing in the things of God, and they get a little more light, and they think they're getting worse. You're not getting worse. You're just dealing with stuff that was there all along, and you didn't see it before. As the light shines brighter, you start to see stuff you didn't see before. So you want to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. Then, Father, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I am willing to be willing. Help me to be willing to willing, that I might know what needs to be done in my life and in my family's life and my children's children's life for generations to come yet, how to make ready a people prepared for what's coming down the road in the days ahead. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
There needs to be a part two. I think I got to one paragraph of a five-page notes. Uh-oh. <laughs> Seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.